Hey everyone, um, in today's lecture, I am going to be talking about multimodal learning. So we can learn representations that combine information from multiple modalities, by which I mean modalities like vision, text, audio. Uh, the classic multimodal problem, which receives a lot of attention in the deep learning literature is image captioning, um, but there's lots of other potential multimodal applications as well. Um, so for example, it may be natural to think of many document problems as being multimodal um, because they could be done by combining representations from the document images with the OCR texts. And so we'll talk a little bit more about these doc document applications um, in the next part of the course where we get to applications. Um, but today I'm going to be focusing on different types of multimodal architectures. Um, so when working with multiple modalities, you need a way to fuse the representations. You could potentially jointly train a model with images and text to align the representations with each other. So an image of a banana would have the same embedding as the word banana. Um, you can also concatenate or fuse representations together. Um, and this is often done for classification tasks. So when we talked about vision and NLP, we largely saw that there was a coalescence of these fields around a few main models, so ResNet, VIT, a handful of transformer large language models. Um, the multimodal space um, feels more dispersed. Um, it's a very active area, I think, for the development of things like virtual reality. Uh, multimodality is at the center of that, so there's lots and lots of research taking place, um, but it just tends to feel a bit more dispersed and not like there's really kind of a few models that everyone has settled on. Um, so this lecture will cover a range of different models, which is by no means um, comprehensive, uh, but is some of the work that we found kind of most interesting and relevant to date. All right, so I'll start by talking about contrastive models. Um, so this is where you learn an aligned space between different types of representations. Um, then I'll talk about multimodal classification um, and finally say a word about multimodal learning as prefix tuning, um, which we touched on a bit in our last lecture about prompting and prefix tuning. All right, so probably the most famous model in the multimodal space is CLIP. CLIP stands for Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training. Um, it's a model by OpenAI, uh, the same people that brought you GPT. Um, and um, the basic idea is that they contrastively trained a space to align images and their captions. Um, and um, so the word dog should have, you know, a representation close to an image of a dog, or if you say, you know, maybe not specifically a dog, but this image is a dog, you know, it will, it's read the representation of that is going to be close to the representation of the image. Um, and so why is it that you would want to do that? Well, um, an application that they emphasize heavily in motivating clip is zero shot image classification. Um, so if you train a supervised classifier on ImageNet, you have to pre-specify the classes um, and you can only classify kind of images that are into your pre-specified classes. Um, but you might have, um, and, you know, you might have classes that were not seen during training and that using a supervised classable classifier is not amenable to this. Um, and um, so instead what you can do with clip is that you can embed the text of a bunch of different categories, including categories that weren't seen during training. Um, and then you embed the image and um, the you can take its uh, closest neighbor in terms of cosine similarity and classify it as that text. Um, and so essentially this is a way to do uh, zero shot um, text classification, but it's not, it's not a classification problem. It's a nearest neighbor problem. And we've talked about this kind of at other points in the course, and we'll see this a lot when we come to applications, a downside of a supervised classifier is that you have to pre-specify your classes, whereas when you train a contrastive space, you can work directly with those hidden states um, and 
and um, look for nearest neighbors or do clustering and very much kind of that um, clip is in that spirit um, where you can embed kind of whatever text you want even if it wasn't seen during training embed the image and the class of that image you get it from the text of the nearest text embedding to the embedding of the image um, so clip was trained on a proprietary data set um, like a lot of things that OpenAI does um, called web image text and that had 400 million image caption pairs that they scraped from the internet um, and there are now open source web image data sets that also have 400 million pairs, um, which have been used to train open source uh, CLIP models. Um, CLIP was trained with contrastive learning on 256 GPUs for two weeks. It does take a lot of compute to train a model with 400 million image caption pairs. Um, the encoder is a VI, the vision encoder is a VIT, and the text encoder is GPT-2. You know, again, this is a model um, from OpenAI, and so that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it has a symmetric cross-entropy loss. All right. You know, and as I said a word about um, in the motivation when we were looking at the architecture figure, um, a supervised classification model trained on ImageNet can only be applied off the shelf to ImageNet. And so they really kind of drive this home as a limitation of that approach. It doesn't have a zero shot capacity to classify categories unseen during training. Um, they also point out that it was costly to create ImageNet. It required over 25,000 annotators to annotate those 14 million images. And so that no doubt was a kind of a considerable um, cost, um, whereas they scrape their 400 million images from the internet and there's no um, really human uh, supervision required there. Okay, um, and um, so in the paper they give examples of performance um, on different data sets, including non-ImageNet data sets. Um, and so this is a data set called Food 101. We'll see this come up a couple more times in this lecture. Um, Food 101 has um, images of food and a text description. Um, and so they're using the images from this data set and then they um, encode the text descriptions. Um, and you can see that the closest neighbor um, to this particular image is the embedding of the text, a photo of guacamole, a type of food, um, which is um, the correct class, uh, guacamole. Um, and um, so that's how they do zero-shot classification. Um, you know, guacamole, I don't, it's maybe not an image net, um, but they're able to do it by training on these um, paired image caption data. Um, so people had this idea before CLIP, um, you know, to contrastively train um, an image language model, but CLIP really, really popularized it. Um, so I thought that this uh, tweet from uh, Chris Manning, who's a really influential figure in NLP, um, was pretty interesting. He's saying, you know, he's happy to share um, that their paper, paper convert um, was finally accepted, like at a health conference, I think. Um, and so they first wrote this paper in 2020. Um, it was a pioneering work in contrast of learning of perception by using naturally occurring pairs of texts. Um, Unfortunately, he says things took a winding path from there. Um, it, the paper is called Contrast of Learning of Medical Visual Representations from Paired Images and Text. Um, and um, they kind of it showed great performance, but he says sometimes you don't get lucky with reviewing. Um, they couldn't interest referees at it. Um, and um, the fact that it was in radiology um, and not something like, you know, showing performance on ImageNet, dampened interest. <laughs> and then, of course, along comes, um, along comes Clip, and I'm sure that no doubt he tries to submit it to places and people say, oh, Clip already did that. Um, but um, just kind of all to say that the idea um, maybe wasn't, you know, necessarily original to Clip, but they did it on 400 million images, <laughs> which... Um, you know, um, nobody else had done before and were really able to kind of um, show um, the power of um, contrastive uh, pre-training at that scale. All right. Um, 
And so now I want to talk about another paper, um, locked in tuning. Um, I believe this is a Google paper uh, from 2022. Um, and um, they talk about the different design choices uh, for contrastive image and text training, in particular focusing on whether you freeze um, one of the models and whether you use pre-trained models. Um, and so uh, the first, um, the blue, is what they call locked and pre-trained. Um, so they're gonna take the image encoder and they're gonna freeze it using a state-of-the-art pre-trained image encoder, so like a VIT. I think they experiment with using a ResNet as well. Um, so they're gonna lock that. And then in the contrastive training, only the text model, which will be like a BERT, um, will be allowed to update. Um, a second approach is unlocked, but using pre-trained models. Um, so they're using um, a pre-trained ImageNet um, backbone again, and um, a pre-trained uh, text language model like BERT. Um, but now they're both unlocked. And so in contrastive training, uh, the parameters of both of those models are updated with backprop. Um, and then the third approach, which would be like the approach of clip, is unlocked and trained from scratch. Um, and so essentially the idea is that LIT for locked end tuning, it freezes the vision encoder so that image encoder isn't going to change, but the text encoder will update and they have these uh, paired um, image caption data and then um, kind of contrastively the model will update at each round. Um, it, with the goal of aligning um, the uh, text embeddings to the vision embeddings. So the uh, text embedding of hot air balloon will be um, similar to the text embedding of an image of a hot air balloon. Um, and you know the same thing um, for a variety of different um, paired image caption pairs, where again, this is data that comes from scraping the internet. So it's probably pretty noisy. Um, which is potentially important to keep in mind. Um, and so they find good performance. So they're looking at ImageNet, um, kind of two versions of ImageNet at CIFAR 100, um, which is kind of a slightly older version of ImageNet with 100 classes, but similar in many ways, and then at PETS. Um, so um, classifying different types of PETS. And you can see that the, um, the locked um, version um, outperforms the unlocked version um, that is um, using a pre-trained image encoder, which in turn uh, beats out the one that is not using a pre-trained image encoder. So I think there's no surprises that starting with a state-of-the-art pre-trained ImageNet, um, pre-trained on ImageNet vision encoder will beat out training from scratch. Um, that's kind of, um, yeah, not at all surprising. Um, but it's a little bit surprising at first glance that locking the vision model is a good thing to do. Um, this is showing some other results. Um, so if you look at clip um, performance on ImageNet or another kind of um, larger um, but clip-like model called Align, um, they are getting about 77% um, accuracy, which is kind of well below the state-of-the-art model that is fine-tuned on ImageNet. So take a pre-trained backbone and then fine-tune it um, on um, um, uh, further, um, and it's getting an accuracy of above 90%. Um, and um, you can see that locked-in tuning helps to kind of close that gap um, you know, as I mentioned, CLIP is trained on something proprietary. Um, so they do kind of another exercise where they take their data and they train um, a vision text uh, contrasted model from scratch. Um, and then they have an unlocked image encoder, but they're using pre-trained um, uh, pre image net um, encoder for the vision side of it. And then they have the locked in tuning. Um, and, you know, as we saw in the previous table, looking even across a variety of different numbers of image text pairs, ranging from, you know, a modest data set size of like 
um, a couple hundred million um, to um, a, a very, very large um, data set. Um, they're uh, finding that locked in tuning does better. Um, so why is this the case? Why are they, why would locking the vision encoder help? And by the way, why are they locking the vision encoder and not the text encoder? Um, and so I think it's important here to note that they're evaluating zero shot image classification um, on ImageNet and ImageNet-esque benchmarks like CIFAR uh, and PETS. Um, your first question might be, you know, well, like using a pre-trained backbone and freezing it is, is test set leakage um, driving the results? And they argue that that's not the case, but it can be pretty hard um, to remove um, like a test set leakage um, when you're training on kind of a massive number of images and captions scraped from the internet, because I think a lot of the images and ImageNet also came from the internet. Um, but I mean, I didn't go into the detail of how they're re removing duplicates. So let's just assume that it's not because of test set leakage. Um, well, I think kind of when you stop and think about it, um, they also look at cross modal retrieval. So that's when you retrieve images with their text or text with their images, and they find no benefit of locked in tuning. Um, and in fact, when you train for a long time, and say you're trying to retrieve text with an image, unlock training has an edge. Um, and so it's really um, what they're doing well on is zero shot image classification. Um, and when you kind of think about it, um, well, uh, pre-trained vision encoders, we know that they provide really meaningful representations, right? Because um, the state-of-the-art pre-trained vision encoders are the encoders precisely that perform the best. Um, and so they take this really, really great vision encoder, um, and when they lock it, that forces the text encoder to align with this state-of-the-art image encoder. So in contrast, when it's not locked, um, the authors argue that it may become overly specialized in the particular image caption data set that's used for alignment and then not perform so well on other things. Um, so of course, kind of your very your your mileage from <laughs> trying a similar approach and locking the image encoder may kind of vary depending what you evaluate on. Um, but it kind of makes sense. Um, that there's um, some benefit to taking this encoder that we know for vision it already performs really well um, and then forcing the text to align with that versus kind of allowing everything to move um, uh, just based on whatever your training data set is. Um, you know, as I mentioned, these large image caption pair data sets, they're pretty noisy. I'm sure they're very noisy compared to ImageNet. <laughs> you know, so that could be kind of another reason why it's um, sort of problematic, um, more problematic not to, not to lock it. Um, and so this relates to a notion of like catastrophic forgetting too, that maybe you have this great kind of ImageNet pre-trained backbone, and then um, in this case, it's not that it's like a small data set they're tuning on, they're tuning on a massive data set of images and captions, but it's somehow maybe forgetting part of this knowledge that it's um, gained through being trained on, on ImageNet. Um, and I would guess kind of lear learning some of the noise and these noisy uh, image captioning data sets. Um, but I think in general, like it's an interesting point that d in doing multimodal, um, work of this nature that it might be beneficial to lock one of the models. All right, so that's locked in tuning, um, which was essentially clip, but for the vision encoder um, is uh, using a pre-trained state-of-the-art model um, and locking it and forcing the text encodings to align um, with the space that had been learned from um, ImageNet pre-training. And by the way, they did do some ablations where they showed that this was beneficial, whether you use, like their baseline is supervised ImageNet pre-training. I think it's like just a VIT, um, 
but they showed on Dino it was also it also worked well. Um, and so kind of these state-of-the-art encoders, they've learned very good representations and it worked well to force the text to align to that rather than to let it kind of both of them move based on the image and caption um, data. Another model I wanted to mention just briefly in passing is contrastive captioners, which is also um, from Google. Um, and um, so they point out here that you could have, you know, you tend to have a few different types of models. Um, so you could have um, a single image encoder model. So you have an image and you encode it and then you do classification with that. Um, so that would be, you know, like a ResNet or a VIT by itself. Um, in the multimodal space, you could align the image encoder um, and the text model. Um, and um, so this is essentially like cross-modal alignment. Um, or um, for image captioning, um, you could have um, cross-attention between an image encoder and a text encoder and decoder. Um, and um, so these are essentially encoder-decoder models. Um, and um, what contrastive captioning does is to combine these different approaches. And so there's you, it's trained on image and text, um, and um, you train a contrastive loss to align the image encoding and the text encoding. Um, but then through cross attention, um, you also have a captioning loss. Um, and that's done with a multimodal text decoder uh, that then can attend um, to the image encoder with cross attention. Um, and so you have these different um, losses um, and essentially to combine them to get a model that where a single model can handle multiple problems. So this is simultaneously produces aligned unimodal image and text embeddings and joint multimodal representations which means that a single model can be used for a variety of, of downstream tasks. And you'll see that this is kind of like a theme in this literature um, is um, trying to get a single model that does a bunch of things. All right. Um, and so that was um, contrastive models. Um, so these are models that um, you train them on images um, and captions, at least in kind of, you don't, they didn't even have to be images and captions, but that's been the majority of work in this space. Um, so train them on images and captions to produce an aligned space um, where the embedding for a text is um, similar um, to the embedding for an image of that text. Um, and you can do that, Clip did it from scratch on a very large number of image captions. Um, and we saw the Manning, briefly a Manning paper, he'd done that earlier um, on uh, radiology data. Um, you could lock the vision encoder and use a state-of-the-art vision encoder like locked in tuning. Um, you could potentially combine a contrastive loss with an encoder decoder loss where you're feeding in an image and producing a caption um, as a kind of a text generation, um, which may be useful um, if you wanted to use a single model to do multiple tasks. Um, so now I wanna say a little bit about multimodal classification. Um, and so what I mean by multimodal classification is that um, you have an image and you have a text and you want to jointly classify that pair. So this is different than the motivation for a clip where you like you just have an image and you want to know the class of that and you can do it in a zero shot fashion because you can just encode whatever your class, you still have to kind of pre-specify them but you didn't have to train on them so you can encode up uh, what you think the classes are and just take the nearest text pair. Whereas here I'm talking about the, the nearest text, but here I'm talking about something very different, which is you already have the image and its associated text and you want to feed those into a classifier. Um, and so unlike with um, 
you know, the contrast in models that we talked about where you're using nearest neighbor um, or clustering, if you're using a classifier head, the spaces don't necessarily need to be aligned. Um, whereas, like, you know, obviously, like in CLIP, you're taking uh, the cosine similarity between your image encoding and your text encoding. So those spaces have to be aligned or that like approach is nonsense. Uh, but if you have representations and you're gonna feed them into a classifier head, the spaces don't necessarily need to be aligned. Um, and so there's different approaches here. Um, you could concatenate vision and text output representations that were trained with separate models. So one of them could be trained with a VIT and one of them could be trained with BERT. You just concatenate those and feed them into a classification head. Um, or you could jointly embed images and text uh, with a transformer. Um, and so I want to give a couple of examples of this. Um, and um, so the first model is called multimodal bit trans, uh, sorry, multimodal by transformers, um, which is by uh, Meta AI. Um, and this is actually probably the oldest paper we'll look at today. It's all the way back from 2020. Um, and, um, so what they do is to concatenate linear projections of a ResNet output with BERT token embedding. So this was really before like VIT was a thing. So they take linear projections of ResNet and concatenate that output with BERT token embeddings. And this concatenated sequence is put into a transformer. Um, and they use the first output of the final layer, like a class token. Um, as input to their classification layer. And so this is, again, just taking um, linear projections of ResNet, concatenating it with a text, and passing the whole thing through a transformer, which will allow for flexible cross-attention between the image inputs and the text token inputs, um, and then doing classification, kind of just like you would if this whole thing was just text. Um, but in this case, um, part of the sequence is, um, is an image and uh, part of its text. So their benchmarks um, are um, an IMDB data set, like uh, classifying um, the um, genre um, of movie data where you have an image and a text description. Food 101, which I mentioned we saw before, um, where they were classifying zero shot the images in food 101. Um, but in the benchmark, you have an image of a food and you have the description of that food. Um, and, um, and so you could kind of input both of those into the transformer or there's this um, SNLI data set, which is NLI. Um, but in addition to the text premise and hypothesis, you have an image of whatever is going on in the text. Um, and this is the result. So BOW is a bag of words. Um, and then image um, is um, just a ResNet model alone. And BERT is just BERT alone. Um, let's like focus on the middle column, which is the Food 101 data set. The other ones kind of show a similar picture. Um, and so the bag of words stuff doesn't really do great. And actually the image alone in this particular data set does, does less well. Um, so late fusion is they just take the, um, uh, the softmax score from a BERT and from a separate ResNet and average those and take the highest one and that actually does like pretty well. Um, and so 91.1 .1, um, accuracy um, on predicting the food, which of the 101 food classes the image text pair is in. Um, concatenate BERT is just concatenating um, the um, class token uh, from BERT and the class token from ResNet and sending that to a classifier head. And then MMBT is their transformer where they pass both of the representations into the transformer. And you can see like they do better than the late fusion where they're just 
um, averaging the softmax scores from the two separate models and the better when them when they concatenate, but actually kind of not dramatically. Okay. This is another model. So this is CMA clip. This is from Amazon. Um, and it's essentially a very similar model, but there's a couple of differences. So they're using clip um, to embed the text and to embed the images rather than using ResNet and BERT. Um, and so that's kind of, you might think that that would be advantageous because clip is an aligned space. Um, so they use clip to embed the text and embed the image, and then they pass that into a transformer. So just like the previous one we saw, um, but then out of their transformer, there's two uh, class tokens. There's the class token for the text and the class token for the image. Um, and they take a learned weighted sum of that that can vary depending on the task they're doing. So like the first one's predicting color um, and they're like predicting different things about these products. I mean, and so you can understand why something like this is kind of like core to Amazon's business model. People upload images of products and text descriptions of products, and then Amazon puts those into classes. Um, and, um, and so yeah, the two differences here are that it's using clip embeddings um, and instead of using ResNet and BERT embeddings um, to feed into the transformer. And um, it's taking a learned weighted sum of the class tokens from the two embeddings rather than just having a single class token, um, which they argue is useful because you could do different types of classification tasks with this and you might wanna weight the image and the text representations differently depending on the classifications. Um, this is an Amazon paper and the paper is kind of thin on details and there's no code base. Um, but I think it is sort of um, essentially MMBT, um, but using clip embeddings and with this difference in having the two class tokens. Um, and so their benchmarks are some internal Amazon data set, um, again, Food 101 and a fashion data set, again, with images and text descriptions. Um, and so again, let's look at Food 101. Um, we kind of see what we did with the other paper, VIT alone doesn't do that great. Bert does like alone does okay, but not fantastic. Clip um, off the shelf does a bit better. Uh, there's MMBT that we just saw and CMA clip is beating it again, not by a huge amount, but um, you know, if you look at the kind of 8% of mistakes that are made, it's knocking off a fair number of those. I think a lot of that is probably just using the clip embeddings that are um, are already aligned. Um, you know, so you might say like, you know, um, why do why do I care about like food 101? Um, but you know what what paper we'll talk about in an application when we get there, you know, my group is working on um, using kind of similar methods, although we're, we're doing it as a clustering problem and not as a, as a nearest neighbor problem, not as a classification problem, but to do record linkage, where you have an image of a firm name and the OCR of a firm name, and um, both the language and the vision are very helpful um, to getting higher record linkage rates and kind of dramatically higher rates than you get just using string matching methods, which are what overwhelmingly predominate. And so I think that there's kind of lots of interesting applications like this to documents. Okay. Um, and so the models we saw allowed for cross attention between all vision and text tokens, but there are sparser ways to parameterize attention. And so this is um, a paper by Google, I believe, called the Multimodal Bottleneck Transformer. Um, and instead of, um, so what they call late fusion is that you just, um, you don't allow for cross attention. You just combine the kind of representations at the end. Um, and bottleneck fusion is where you allow kind of the, um, uh, here they're doing video in blue and audio in pink. Um, you allow for attention between them, but you, do this in a bottleneck. So you're forcing the model to combine all the representations from the video before the audio can see it. 
and forcing the model to combine in a given layer all the representations of the audio before the video side can see it. Um, it finds that bottleneck attention works well for video applications. Bottleneck attention forces the model within a given layer to condense information from one modality before sharing it with the other, but it's still allowing for attention flow, like normal attention flow within a modality, like as in a standard transformer. They apply it to sound classification and action recognition. So the sound classification is this data set called audio set. It has 632 audio event classes um, and over 2 million labeled 10 second sound clips that are taken from YouTube videos. Um, and categories are things like, you know, playing a piano, um, you know, um, people making various types of sounds, etc. Um, and so this is kind of interesting. So these are the attention maps. Um, and so they show um, the, um, uh, the image um, and um, the class of it. And then they show the cross attention between the audio and the video with the vanilla fusion. So where you allow for full cross attention and with them with their um, bottleneck transformer. Um, and so you can see in the dog barking like with, with vanilla um, cross attention to kind of fuse the two representations. Um, the red, it's like attending to the dog's entire head, um, whereas it, with the bottleneck um, fusion, it's um, attending more to just the dog's mouth. Um, some of them look pretty similar, like the panel one looks pretty similar. It's attending to the fingers. Um, the bird one looks very similar. Um, yodeling, um, it's maybe again like more focused on the person's mouth. Um, and so they sort of argue based on this that, um, that the bottleneck transformer is forcing the attention to be very specifically um, on <laughs> the part of the video that is making the sound. Um, which I think this attention maps, it's just like, it's pretty cool. <laughs> like, it, I don't know how much to make of these differences. I think it's, um, you know, it's impressive that the bottleneck attention can do nearly as well as the vanilla uh, attention used to fuse the modalities, but it's like just particularly impressive um, that how much the audio learns what it needs to attend to in the video. I think it's just a really cool example of attention maps. All right, so that's multimodal classification, which again, just to recap, is that um, you have multiple modalities. Um, so say that you have um, both um, an image and a text um, description of products on Amazon, or you have um, both a video and an audio data set and you wanna classify what sounds are being made. Um, and, um, and so you're using kind of both of those in a classification problem, but this is a kind of a traditional classification problem where you have a classifier head versus the zero shot classification we saw that contrastive learning allows where now you have this meaningful metric space and you can just have whatever class you want at inference time. Um, because you can just embed the text of that class. All right. Um, so I just finally wanted to say a word about work in the prefix uh, tuning space, um, which we also talked a little bit about last class. Um, so this was the paper few shot learning with frozen language models. Um, and here they take a language model um, and they freeze it. Um, but um, they train the vision encoder. Um, and so they're doing backprop um, through um, the vision encoder, but allowing for you know, full cross attention between the vision encodings and the language encodings, um, but the language encodings are frozen. Um, and then you know, sort of at test time, um, they can use this to do uh, visual question answering uh, few shot classification um, 
which is pretty cool where they give kind of the model examples um, of things with made up words and then see if the model is able to learn that with just a few examples. Um, another interesting application is a model called ClipCap, um, which is, um, you know, instead of freezing the language model and learning the vision embeddings through prefix tuning on the vision embeddings, you could freeze both the language model and the vision model and learn a mapping function from the pre-trained vision embedding into the language model space. Um, and so ClipCap um, does this uh, with clip and embedding, sorry, with clip embeddings. Um, and um, it's mapping those into the same space as word embeddings in GPT-2. Um, and so they find uh, that increasing the prefix size leads to better performance. Um, when the language model is frozen, the preferred mapping function is a transformer with eight multi-headed self-attention layers and with eight attention heads. Um, and so I think like that's necessary because these spaces are not aligned at all to begin with and to be able to kind of map the vision space, which is a high dimensional space into the, the language space, you really need a very flexible function, which, you know, the ultimate um, expressive function is a transformer with multi-headed self-attention. Um, but if the language model can be tuned, so now you're not freezing the language model, you're just freezing the vision model, um, they say a multi-layer perceptron is enough um, because then obviously you're able to update the language model to align it so you don't need um, the same degree of flexibility to map one space into another. Um, and so this is the architecture picture from ClipCap. Um, and it's likewise used for tasks, you know, like captioning and visual question answering. All right, um, so that's all I have on multimodal learning. I know it's kind of a little bit of a grab bag of models, but hopefully it introduces everyone to kind of the basic ideas behind how we can combine information um, from multiple modalities, which I think is going to become an increasingly prevalent application. Um, so I will really look forward to discussing um, all of this in class on Thursday. Thank you.